All praise is due to Allah, the one and only one God. May the peace and blessings be upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at taslim and kathira. I'd like to start first by a person who came to Umar ibn al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. And he said, I just had a baby boy. If you can tell me what do I owe him of his rights? He said, you are too late. He said, he was born today. He said, you should have came to ask me how to choose his mother. That's when the rights of your children start. Mm -hmm. Talking about the Islamic perspective of how to stop domestic violence goes really from the core understanding of Islam. Islam tells us that our presence on earth is to worship God. And Surah Al-Dhariyat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I have not created jinn or ins, but to worship him. So I don't know where could someone see worshiping God through beating up people. I can't make the connection. It just goes against what Islam is all about. I read many verses, Allah speaking about the aggression, the ghulm, how hatred is it to Allah from the type of aggression that was on the level of Fir'aun, Pharaoh, or the dhulm where the Prophet ﷺ said, do you know who is the bankrupt? He said, the one who has no money, O Prophet of Allah. He said, the bankrupt from our nation or from our ummah is the one who comes at the day of judgment with salah and siyam and zakah and hajj. He has done all that. But he would come where he had hit people, or said foul people, or hurt people in their words. So people will stand up at the day of judgment and will start asking to be tried fairly. So when people come and ask for their right to be paid back to them, his rewards will be taken out from him, his own good deeds, and would be given to those people whom he mistreated until there is no more hasanat left for him. And then they will say, there is no more hasanat left for them, for this person. Allah will say, take from the sayyat, the bad deeds of that person and put it on him. And then he will be sent into hellfire for that. I see it in the uh, holy hadith, the hadith al-Qudusi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ibadi inni harramtu dhulma ala nafsi. O my servants, I have declared that aggression is haram on myself. وَجَعَلْتُهُ بَيْنَكُمْ مُحَرَّمًا And I have declared it that it is haram among you. فَلَا تَظَالَمُوا Let no one be in the status of aggression toward another person. I see it in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ said, الْمُسْلِمُ أَخُ الْمُسْلِمُ A Muslim is the brother of a Muslim. لا يظلمه He will not mistreat him. وَلَا يَحْقِرُهُ He will not humiliate him. If I'm supposed to do that with a... Someone that I don't know, a stranger who happens to be a Muslim in the street. What about my own family? If I'm supposed to be so much sensitive about that with people who happen to be my brothers in Islam and the general concept of being brothers and sisters, what about my own family, my own, uh, my, my wife or my children, etc., etc.? So starting from there, it's a matter of an education approach that there is no place in Islam for zulm and, and beating people and hitting people and being aggressive toward people is part of the zulm. Imagine you are, uh, as a man, if the person is abusive, stopped by one of those secret uh, police, you know, in, in some of the Muslim or Arab countries and you have been humiliated or beaten in front of people, how would you feel? That's exactly the same way if a person who, from for you happens to be a female or a child that they are helpless, they can't defend themselves, and you fail to communicate your matters with them, and then you take it into force, and you take it as some people like to call it the shortcut. The shortcut that will guarantee you that you are engaging in an act that, that is haram, and that would lead you, as the hadith said, probably into losing all your hasanat, the good deeds that you are doing, probably even acquiring some sayyat that will end you up in heaven and in hell, God forbids. 
when we talk about prevention of, of domestic violence, we talk about uh, education to our children when they are young, that marriage is a place for sakina. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا Sakina comes from the word sakana, to be stable, you know, where you rest. And, and this is the sakina, and then it was brought next to love and mercy. Mawadda wa rahma. So the sakina and the perspective of the human person that is from within, that is a gift to be put in the heart of people from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this gift, you need to be worthy of it, to deserve it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا Those who strive to please us, we shall guide them to our path. So to acquire sakina in your life, in your heart, with you and your family, you have to be reaching out to get it, and then Allah will put it in your heart as a, as a gift or, or something that you might look at as a fruit, an outcome of your effort and that, where is it being put. So education is very good from the time when our children are young, that this is a place where you're gonna go and relax and, and, and look every time I do a marriage and nikah in my, in my office, the first thing I ask the couples who are getting, why are you getting married? Is it just a social, you know, you're now 25 and she's 21 and it's time? In Islam, we are told that even marriage is an act of worship toward God. Man faqad the one who gets married, he has fulfilled half of his faith. So the same way I look at my prayer or my fasting or my pilgrimage, that I need to perfect it, to present it to Allah as an act of worship, marriage is an act of worship that I need to present to Allah. So I am in the business of trying to perfect it in the way that it will be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it takes to educate yourself about it, if it takes to practice patience, if it takes to be responsible, if it takes to be there for your family whenever they are, you are needed, then all these components come into not just the level of performance or uh, doing your duties, but rather than al-ihsan, because acts of ibadah rise from the, the, the normal level of performance to the ihsan. Ihsan means an ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah, to worship Allah as if you see him. But if you don't see him, he sees you, meaning to, to associate the conscious that Allah is watching you constantly, so you always perfect your acts. In marriage, when you are alone, in your house where there's no one else to see you or to document your actions, you have to have ihsan. You have to be connected with Allah, that Allah is watching you. That's why the Prophet ﷺ once gave a, a description to fear Allah and the treatment of your wives, they're more like, you know, in your house, you're in charge. You can be abusive or you can be honorable. You choose what to do. And the Prophet was, uh, ﷺ, directing us to be honorable with them. When we talk about prevention matters in uh, matters of, of uh, preventing domestic violence, uh, the choice that we make for our children when they grow up and, and get married, um, for the time being, I'm gonna be a little, little bit fast. But also, uh, seminars prior to uh, marriages. Uh, I was told that Malaysia has a two-week program for anyone who wants to get married, that they have to go five days a week and finish these two weeks program. It's, it's presented by religious leaders, by professionals, you know, and all that. It covers all the area of marriage. What is it all about? To live with someone. I mean, 20 some years I'm living in my own family, my own way, and then here comes another person with their own different ways. How can we communicate? How can we cope? How can we respect? And it was said that Malaysia has the least number of divorces, as far as I know. Uh, unfortunately, we have tried that, and Imam Majid, who was uh, interviewed here in the video, came once and, and presented a two-day seminar at our masjid. And he said, we should do this in our masjid. We said, Imam, practically, this sometimes tough. We have people coming from other states, they have one day. They just want to get the nikah done and go back, or people don't have time. But we can go and educate people about the importance. So they can come even after the nikah, prior to the marriage, and sometimes many people do the nikah and delay the marriage one month or two months, whatever. In that period, let us say, okay, can you come in between one-on-one, -on -one, you know, 
I can make a designated day with all the couples coming at one day seminar, or I can do it one person at a time and educate them, not just about it's haram to beat or to hit or something like that, but how to enjoy life as a husband and wife. I mean, this is meant to bring mawadda and rahmah and sakinah. And, and if people are not enjoying that, then we, we, we should feel يعني, responsible that marriage is meant for these people to enjoy these things. And these are quality type of, of relationships. Uh, many references in that perspective about education in the Quran and the Sunnah. The Prophet saw, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَعَاشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Treat them بِالْمَعْرُوفِ The term ma'roof is so beautiful in the Quran. What is known to be honorable, what is known to be acceptable, the term ma'roof, we are the ummah of al-amr bil-ma'roof. We are the ummah, sarrihunna bi-ma'roof, aashirunna bi-ma'roof. The term has been used in many different ways in relation to what, uh, in the concept of value, if it was moral or ethical, or if it what was acceptable in the tradition of the people as to be honorable and acceptable too. The Prophet, for example, sallallahu said, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ أَخْلَاقًا وَأَلْطَفُهُمْ بِأَهْلِهِ the most perfect people of faith are those who are uh, honorable in their manners and wa altafuhum bi ahlihi. Al-lutf is to be very cautious and recognizable of the needs of the person next to you. I mean al-lutf. That's why Allah al-latif. He is aware of our needs, so He treats us in, in relation to what we need. Uh, he knows our, our vulnerabilities. So to be latif with your family is to be aware. So if I have an issue that my wife or my husband, and sometimes domestic violence goes both ways, you know, to be fair with the brothers, you know, uh, you have to be aware of what are the backgrounds of your wife or your husband, what type of issues they were raised in, and then to be aware and then try to deal with that, not just demand what you have inherited as ABC of marriage, and then if you don't see that, you're going to be going, you know, outrageous and aggressive and in that perspective. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us another thing. لا يفرق مؤمن المؤمنة Let no one hate his wife. إن كره منها خلقا If he hates something about her manners أحب منها خلقا آخر He will love something else. No one is perfect. I mean, you might not like the way that your wife is, um, you know, can't control her hand in spending and that's creating a lot of problems in the family. But she might be a good mother. She might be a very good uh, patient person with you in the house. Or someone else could be, uh, and uh, she could be triggered very fast and even she can get angry and raise her voice. But she could be a very good person who uh, raises the kids, uh, being responsible next to you, help you in the house. The same thing if the wife doesn't like something about her husband, he might be a good father, he might be a good... I mean, we need to be looking in the general aspect of what is the best in general and make, you know, uh, be fair. Allah made these, uh, you know, standards. He said, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى Allah will weigh things at the end of judgment in the very smallest particles or whatever. And upon that, it will decide if we're going to go to heaven or hell. No one is complete. That's what we know for sure. I will finish, to be prompt in time, with the most known issue about, you know, that Islam allowed people to, to, to hit and to be and I'm here quoting from the verse in Surah An-Nisa, verse 34. The translation goes as Men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has given the one of more strength than the other and because they support them from their means. Therefore, the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in the husband's absence what Allah would have them, uh, would want have, uh, them to guard. As to those women who's, uh, on whose part you fear disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first, next refuse to share their beds and last lead them and then between parentheses lightly but if they return to obedience seek not against the means of um, uh, annoyance uh, for Allah is most high and, and great above all people of uh, who, who mean harm of Islam and people who are ignorant about Islam happens to be Muslims 
they come and take the literal meaning from this text and they say, okay, it says, you know, be there. And it doesn't even say in the translation lightly. It's the uh, interpretation. Uh, we say this is the understanding. Who is the number one translator and interpreter of the Quran? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi And I have 23 even before Islam. From the time he was born Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till the time he died and he uh, met his Lord. It was never recorded any case of abuse on his behalf. His own wife Aisha. We have a hadith that says, مَا رَفَعَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يَدَهُ قَطْ The Prophet ﷺ never raised his hand ever. إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ مُجَاهِدًا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ Unless he was in a battle, he was raised his hand. And then another hadith, he never hit any maid or servant ever or child. So if I have the number one translation, interpretation of the Quran as the character of the Prophet And I have the ayah and the other verses of the Quran tells me لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, in the Prophet ﷺ, in the Messenger of Allah, there was a role model, a good role model. And none of that demonstrated the concept of beating. So why I am interpreting it in my, in my own perspective as the literal meaning? Number one. Number two. When I talk about the issue of uh, beating in Islam, I see it in the verb daraba. Daraba in the Arabic language can mean two things. The literal meaning of beating, and it means to keep distance between you and someone. For example, in Surah Al-Muzzammil, at the last verse of Surah Al-Muzzammil, عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّ سَتَضْرِبُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ that you will travel and, and, and travel far distances. And he used the term daraba, tadribuna fil Do I go and hit the floor like that? No, tadribun means to travel. So if I look at the verse and I have that you talk to them first and then you don't share the bed with them as a second, it fits perfectly that you keep distance more further between you and them, not to beat them literally. And if I look at the uh, example of the Prophet himself, وسلم, when he had issues with his wife, what did he say? Go back to your ha family houses. And then the verse came in Surah Al-Tahrim and in Surah Al-Talaq. If you wish to be with the Prophet or not, you know, Allah gave him the choice. Do, do they want to stay with the Prophet or not? So the practice himself, when he had problems with his own wife, like everyone have issues, he told them, go back and stay with your families. So he practiced, as the way I understand it, that the term فَضْرِبُهُنْ as keep distance between you, between you and me. <coughs> and even with the interpretation, and I will finish with this, uh, for the beating, all the scholars agree that it is meant to be a symbolic reference of being uh, annoyed or disagreeing on her you know, manners and, and the way she behaves with you. And the only thing you can use, although I'm not in support of that, I am in support of what I stated, my understanding means daraba to keep distance, but also in reference to those people who are saying, using the beating, it was conditioned. It was conditioned by being more of a symbolic reference by using a toothbrush, a siwak. So if someone is angry at his wife, you're supposed to, if you want to do like get a siwak, a toothbrush, and you know, uh, show some sort of like disagreement with her. And I would finish with a quote, three quotes actually. The first one from Imam al Bukhari in his Sahih. And he said, you know, if you study Imam al Bukhari, his Sahih, the topics and the way he sorts the index is fiqh by itself. You study the fiqh from the topics. He said, Babu ma yukrah fi darb al nisa. What is not preferred. So he already declared it as something what? Not preferred in Islam. Then, Imam Ata, he was one of the, uh, Imam al Haram, he was one of the tabi'een, one of the greatest scholars in our, in our history. Narrated to him through Imam Ibn al-Arabi, the well-known faqih of the school of Imam Maliki, he said, 
the, the Ibn al-Arabi narrating to uh, the Tabi'i Ata. He said, Ata saying, La yadribuha, a narration of, to this verse. He shall not hit her. وَإِنْ أَمَرَهَا وَنَهَاهَا فَلَمْ تُطِعُهُ Even if he orders her something and she doesn't obey him, he will not hit her. These are the words of Imam Ata. وَلَكِنْ يَغْضَبْ عَلَيْهَا But he will be angry at her. And then Al-Qadi Ayyad, one of the greatest scholars in our history, also said, هَذَا مِنْ فِقْهِ عَطَى This conclusion that even if she disobeys him, he should not go into force and beating, is part of the knowledge of fiqh of Imam Ata that you only get angry at her and you do not use force in that perspective. And he said, فَهَذَا مِنْ فَهْمِهِ بِالشَّرِيعَةِ وَوُقُوفِهِ عَلَى مَغَانِ الْإِشْتِهَادِ This is part of his real understanding of the wholesome concept of Sharia, that it brought, Allah revealed Sharia to uh, bring benefits and prevent harm. This is what we say. أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ الشَّرِيعَةِ لِجَلْبِ الْمَصَالِحِ وَلِذَلْ الْمَفَاسِدِ To bring benefits and to prevent harm. So this goes in harmony with that. And uh, the last thing that I will be quoting would be a, a reference to this hadith by uh, Dr. Jamal Badawi, who is well known, uh, and he was at Isna also. He said, as defined by the hadith, it is not permissible to strike anyone's face, cause any bodily harm, or even be harsh. What the hadith qualifies as darban ghayra mubarrah, light strike or tap, was interpreted by early jurists as a symbolic use of siwak, the toothbrush. They further qualified permissible striking as that which leaves no mark on the body. It is interesting that this latter 14 centuries old qualifier is the criterion used in contemporary American law to separate a light and harmless tap from abuse in the legal sense. This makes it clear that even this extreme last resort and lesser of the two evils measure that may save a marriage does not meet the definitions of physical abuse or family violence or wife battering in the 20th century law and liberal democracies where such extremes are so commonplace that they are seen as national concerns. This is the, the, the uh, comments of Dr. Badawi in relation to even the term, the beating, that it should be a light tap, a symbolic one using a swag. I'm not in favor of that even. As I said, I am uh, in true belief that the Prophet demonstrated for us how should we understand that verse. He never engaged in that. He practiced it when he had problems with his wife, that he sent the family, if you don't want to be with me, then go back to your wife. If we cannot communicate in Sakina, then everyone should go his own way and let us not go into aggression toward each other. I hope that we can build more on this understanding in the future, inshallah ta'ala. We pray that all our houses will be free from domestic violence. Allahumma ameen wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullah. Sakina, 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 Sakina.